Well, thank you for inviting me to this workshop. It's been very enjoyable. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about education. And um, who would argue that education isn't important? Um, education actually could address one thing that I've noticed, which is the overemphasis on supply reduction. So it seems like a lot of the interventions have been, let's decrease the supply of opioids. Education would allow us to think about demand reduction, trying to get less demand for opioids by training clinicians how to manage pain with other modalities. Now, that all being said, you know, if they're not available, they're not paid for, it makes it more challenging. But I think it, it does, um, can be addressed through education. And the problem with education is that it's slow. All right? It's slow. It takes time to, to make up for all of the lack of education that's occurred in our healthcare training. And so it takes time. And some of the fixes that have been implemented were implemented because things needed to be done immediately. And, um, but it doesn't mean that education hasn't been occurring. I've been involved since the beginning of the FDA's Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy Opioid REMS program is how it's called. Um, which really started in 2013 and has completed over a thousand training programs and uh, has trained almost 400,000 healthcare professionals from around the country. And so um, things are going on. And so education um, can really be that finely tuned approach to individualizing care as opposed to some of the blunt instruments that occur with policy and, and regulatory changes. Um, and I really do believe that education has the potential benefit, although slow, of reducing overprescribing while maintaining access to care for our patients. Some may ask, and I've certainly thought about this a lot myself, why hasn't there been education? Chronic pain is common. Addiction is common. Opioids have been around for a long time. And although this is not an evidence-based statement, I think I have at least one of the problems, and one of the problems is, and this has been through my work in trying to incorporate education into undergraduate, graduate medical education, as well as continuing education, and that is that most academic centers don't have a department or a center for addiction or pain. And if you don't have a presence in academia, you can't advocate for this to be in the curriculum. You don't see a medical school without a cardiology department or section or a surgery section, and they advocate for content to be included in the curriculum. And so when there isn't someone advocating for pain and addiction to be in the curriculum, it just doesn't exist. So we need to think about that because when it does exist and it's not owned by a department, it's oftentimes very fragmented. And there's duplication of content around pain and addiction. There's missing content. And you can imagine as a learner how frustrating it is to miss large content areas and to hear the same stuff over and over again. And the other challenge is that we need to train everybody at the exact same time. And we can't just start, okay, let's just start with medical students. Because what happens to those medical students when they start to be precepted on the inpatient service or in the um, clinics where they start to see modeling of behaviors that is counter to what they learned. And so we need to train medical students, residents, practicing clinicians simultaneously and now so that everybody is on the same page. But the other problem is when you have a content area that is lacking strong evidence, you see tremendous variability in how things are done. So you can imagine as a learner who is precepted by faculty attending A who hears one way of treating pain or managing opioids or managing an opioid use disorder, and then the next time they see that patient, they're precepted by attending B, who has a completely different take on this whole thing. Because of the lack of evidence, there's lots of variability. And that becomes very challenging in terms of training the next cohort of clinicians when you don't have teachers who are on the same page, again, because of the problems. In terms of what needs to be covered, this stuff is complicated. I mean, we're, we're here in this room for a reason. This is not about measuring blood pressure and titrating blood pressure medications and measuring creatinine's renal function to see if there's adverse effects. We're talking about managing a problem that has subjective measurements, right? So how much pain, how do you measure pain? How do you measure quality of life? How do you measure function in a way that's meaningful? 
And then if you can measure it, how much change is enough to say that this treatment is working? How much pain improvement? One person's 10 is someone else's 8 is someone else's 4. It's all about individualized care, which makes, again, training that much more complicated because there isn't some neat algorithm that I can say that will apply to all patients with pain. It's very individual. And so we really need to push the risk-benefit framework to the best of our ability, despite knowing that both the benefit side of things is subjective as well as the harm side of things. How much out-of-control behavior is enough to say this person has run into problems? That is, they may have a use disorder. Or maybe they fall into that gray zone where they're misusing opioids and running into some risk, but maybe they don't have an opioid use disorder. Um, but I need to make a change. And so these are very common, these are common and very nuanced issues that our trainees need to learn about. And they're not going to learn about it necessarily by listening to a lecture or listening to a webinar. These are skill-based things that we need to learn how to communicate with patients, how to make these very difficult assessments, and how to talk to a patient who, who may want more opioids, but you don't think they're indicated. And these can be very difficult conversations. And it's a whole lot easier to put these conversations off than it is to have that conversation. And so these are really complicated issues. And, and then finally, in terms of education, I think the big controversy is, should it be mandatory? Should we mandate that every single clinician who takes care of patients should be trained? And then I would argue maybe it's not so much about being trained because just because you haven't been trained doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing, and just because you've been trained doesn't mean you know what you're doing. Maybe it's everyone who's treating patients should be competent in how to assess and manage pain, prescribe opioids safely, and assess and manage opioid use disorders. Now, how you measure competency on a national level is a challenge. How do you do it? But I bet you if we got everyone in a room who are experts in education, pain, and addiction, we could come up with strategies to figure out some way of assessing competency on a national level that everybody that holds a DEA license would at least show some level of competency in these areas. And then my, my truly final statement is, we've talked a lot about prescriber education. It can't be about prescriber education. It's got to be about healthcare team education. I can tell you that when I transition a patient with diabetes on insulin, I don't do it alone. Thank goodness I don't do it alone because I wouldn't do a very good job. I use my entire healthcare team, pharmacist, nurse. The problem is that nobody in that healthcare team has received training in pain, addiction, and safe opioid use. And so I can't rely on them either. So if you're just going to focus on training the prescribers, then they're not going to be able to accomplish what they need to accomplish because they need help. And that help needs to come from an entire healthcare team that gets trained in these areas. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. And just before I introduce Patrice, I, I'll at least um, say for later that I think almost everything you just said about the need for training and education around substance use disorder and pain management would also apply to the care of people with serious illness. And so we have the same gaps, I would assert, in the ability and skills of clinicians and the training to talk to their patient, patients about their beliefs, values, and preferences for end-of-life care and serious illness care. So we have multiple gaps then we can talk, you can disagree with that later if, 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 you, if you believe that, but, but you made a really, really powerful point. 